Hey everybody, today we are going to talk about the Trinity. We're making God's image. The doctrine of the Trinity holds that God is three persons, the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, as one God and three divine persons. The three persons are distinct and a part of one of one eternal being. This is reflected in the nature of how human beings are created. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. Notice the plural word usage is there. Our image, our likeness. Likeness is defined as the quality, quality of being alike, resembling, or appearing similar. I also notice the male and female he created them part. Folks, words mean things. It's shocking, but it's true. And it says that for a reason. What that reason is, I don't yet know. There are probably greater implications here that I don't really feel like investigating at the present time, so I will not. I believe that people often misunderstand this to mean that God looks like a human being, and this has been demonstrated throughout the ages in artistic representations of God the Father. Now, to boil this down, though, this is you know, kind of where I'm going. I believe that we humans are actually designed as a system with three major components, just as God himself is a system with components that serve different functions at different times. We can dive into that more another time. Let's focus for now on the human design. First, a quick explanation of the Trinity. That is, the triune nature of God, as the theologian might say. Uh, we have the Father directing things. We have the Son, who became flesh and made himself available as a payment for our sins. Excuse me. And we have the Holy Spirit, sent to us, as outlined in the book of Acts, that Christ said he would send a comfort and help us after he was gone. Here's a quick diagram to show how this works. Note the overlap. These are all God. They are all the same being. There are also three different parts of the system, kind of like you are. Check this out. Here is another similar diagram, which visually represents the legend that St. Patrick used, uh, the shamrock, to explain the Trinity to the various inhabitants of Ireland, by showing that the three leaves are part of the one plant. You like my superb artwork on the stem? Now, if you are living and learning as a disciple of Christ, you know that Christ confirmed this theory when he gave us our one job, the Great Commission, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, from Matthew 28, 19. Now, let me use a fancy word here, and postulate, that we, too, are three parts, yet one being. Here is my diagram for that. See, you have a mind, you have a body, and you have a spirit, or soul. Some deny the existence of the soul. If someone is that naive, I would question their judgment on all kinds of topics. Regarding the human body, Genesis 2.7 says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. All of the elements that go into the formation of the human body can be found in the soil, somewhere on earth. So I guess that makes creating people's bodies the easy part. Regarding the human soul, I believe the breath of life to be the soul or the spirit. Medical science tells us that actual life consists of biological and electrical systems working together, such as when someone's declared brain dead. We can create both of these things, or we'll be able to soon, and can do so now in an artificial sense, though, um, through robotics and artificial intelligence. Still, the best robots are quite dumb, and I don't believe that anybody's Roomba powered up with a soul installed this morning. The soul is what gives people a distinction from trees, from insects, and some might argue from animals. These things are sentient beings, that is, they're able to perceive and be aware of things, but you'll have a hard time convincing me that they all have souls. Your mind is, well, your intelligence, your self-awareness. Let me postulate, there's that word again, that God designed humans as a three-part system to make us more robust. It might seem like a silly statement, but bear with me here. God created man knowing that he would be capable of sinning, even though I'm sure he hoped against it. Free will allowed that sin to occur, and for death, both physical and spiritual, to enter the picture. A person can die, yet their mind and their spirit may remain intact. What? What am I talking about? Okay. Perhaps you're unaware that ghosts are real. Necromancy and magic, too, apparently. 1 Samuel 28, 3-20. through 20. 
Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and had buried him in his own tomb at Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and the spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shurem, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up a camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams, or Urim, or by prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes. In a night, he and two men went to the woman. Consult the spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore, her, swore to her by the Lord. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, Whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel and bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams, so I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that, Lord, now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had not eaten anything all that day and all that night. So, as we see by this, Samuel, though dead, one, still knew who he was, and two, could still communicate and interact with the living, even though he had no physical living body. The spiritist, which necromancer, whatever you want to call her, could see and hear him. Apparently Saul could not. Thus Samuel had a soul and a mind, and the fact that we know who he was would indicate that he also had a body at one point, right? So, even after death, Samuel was robust enough to deliver a final message to King Saul. Not a happy message, but a message and a prophecy nonetheless. My final thoughts on this. You could lose your mind from a head wound, Alzheimer's, mental illness, whatever. I believe your soul and body stay intact, and you can linger on, not dead, for years, with flickers of your mind returning on occasion. You can lose your body. We generalize this as death, and at least, according to 1 Samuel, apparently your mind and spirit stay intact, at least until judgment. Perhaps flickers of your physical form can return as a ghost under proper circumstances. It really is unimportant to me if that's true or not. Here's where I reach the limits of my knowledge, and you smart people, please feel free to educate me in the comments below. I also think you can lose your soul and still keep your body and mind functioning and intact. These are the individuals that some may say are demon-possessed, have given themselves over to complete evil, even diagnosed as sociopaths or having an antisocial personality disorder, perhaps. ICD-10 is a codex from the World Health Organization with disease and symptom classifications in it. It marks traits of people with antisocial personality disorder as having consistent disregard for morals, social norms, and the rights and feelings of others. Other mainstream descriptors for people with that particular condition include inhumane, dangerous, remorseless, arrogant, predatory, controlling, and lacking physical response to telling lies. A quick review of some of the world's most notorious mass murderers will reveal people that appear to have no soul. They also likely fall into one or all of the descriptions above. Here's the last thing I will postulate today. If you can lose your mind, but not the other parts. And if you can lose your body, but not the other parts, then you could potentially also lose your soul, but not the other parts. At the very least, it can be suppressed by outside forces, demons, etc. If this were not the case, where did the need for exorcism come from? What do you think? Hey, if you found any value in this, like it, and share it with your friends. Subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send that out about twice a month. We will never spam you or share your information. And until next time, be blessed, friends.